I never planned for this. They warn you, you know? They, they say, look out. Some, someday it's going to happen to you. Right? Hmm. It was irresponsible of me to fall so deep, so fast, and so foolishly. Every mistake in the book one can make, I, I made them, pal. I made them. But I couldn't not make them. Every line, every detail, it's... It's bewitching, is, is what it is. How do I... I better come clean. Alright. Here it is. My secret. I like gem and the holograms. Th this isn't a joke. I'm, I'm serious. Which is really, I, I guess, the joke. I I'm the joke. Hasbro's Gem was an animated series created to sell a tie-in brand of dolls to young girls. It focused on a fictional female rock band, smothered in 80s glam and given all the production quality of something made by one half of a small baby. It was dripping with vapid vibes, looks tacky, looks dated, it looks like the kind of show where you know from one frame this just that this probably isn't for you. I honestly hadn't heard of it before my university days, not until I watched her a couple of old cartoon intro compilations, you know, just to remind myself that Bucky O'Hare's was the best. And even then I thought, eh, this probably isn't for me. It was only when a friend decided to put the show on as background noise that I found myself finally face to face with what it actually was. Now, all of these suppositions about Gem's vapidity are true, okay? It's all what you think, it's all there. But, friends. I love it. Gem, by pure cosmic accident, ticks all of my boxes, and I find it so baffling, in some cases, that it loops back around to being funny, to being charming, and sometimes, to being genuinely innovative. You want that unpacked? Yeah, okay. Are you going to make another album? What's your real name? How does it feel to be famous? I remember how it all began, with the unexpected death of my father. Our hero, Jerrica Benton, is an influential socialite slash philanthropist, working at both her late father's record company and foster home. The former is, however, stolen by her dad's sinister business partner, Eric Raymond, leaving Jerrica out of pocket and unable to protect her orphans. She then discovers that before his death, he created an <clears throat> secret experimental artificial intelligence and projector called Synergy, yes it is, which creates convincing holograms, and with this, she reimagines herself as Gem, a pop sensation looking to make it big on the music scene. With this newfound fame, she can continue to support those kids and fight Eric Raymond's control of her company. However, no one can know that Jem and Jerrica are one and the same, or Synergy will fall into the wrong hands. You know who you are. The only people who share her secret are her band, the Holograms, made up of her sister Kimber and adopted sisters Aja and Shayna. The girls find themselves entering into new business ventures as they come up with their hits, all the while acting as their own production team, with Kimber writing songs, Shayna making costumes, Aja staring vacantly into the distance. I think she held a class once? I don't know. There's more to be done than just busy work, however, thanks to the honest-to-god conflict offered by Jerrica's war, and it is a war, with Eric Raymond, whose troops of choice are the show's best feature. The Misfits! Pizzazz, Roxy, and Stormer. Yes, there's a rival girl band, the Misfits. Their songs are better, and they're gonna get her. Yeah, this guy gets it. Each episode, Jem and the band find themselves at the mercy of the misfit schemes, be it just the existence of rival competition, which is reasonable conflict enough, or, you know, cheating, stealing, murder. Get someone killed on the set of a movie? Sure. Cause mass destruction by endangering civilians? On it. Whatever this was, they've done it all. They're essentially supervillains, and it's frankly that surprise comic book streak that makes Jem so much more entertaining than I expected. <laughs> The show's creator, Christy Marks, didn't set out to make another Barbie clone. She'd grown up on superhero comics and liked the ones focused on secret identities. She was more interested in science fiction and classic literature, and the appeal of being a storyteller. One of her first jobs was on G.I. Joe, a show heavily focused on the conflict between good and evil in cool costumes to make Monster Men toys. She even wrote for Bucky, go figure. All of that made its way into Gem, under the frills and glitter. So what we actually get is 80s Barbie by way of Batman passing through billions. It's a lot of B. I'm not saying, oh, a girl show can't have this stuff. That, that's way too simple to even begin to touch what I'm talking about. Usually shows like this, especially cartoons, are about kids or characters in extremely caricatured situations. And Gem focuses on adults in the world of ostensibly basic business. Plots revolve around the finer points of contracts and PR exploits and new commercial ventures. Stuff that doesn't normally need to be animated because it doesn't look like it's all been dipped in stale jam. We have a new station that's themed entirely in Lycra. We have a character who looks like an 80s hipster but who has this voice. Don't touch 
Fuck you, me. Fully grown adults who dress themselves that morning suddenly forget they have brains. Oh, no! Rio, you see? Malone here is a private detective. The best in the biz. Intruder, 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 intruder. The usual melodrama is ratcheted up to plain ludicrous, and I am so deeply glad for that, turning things we would otherwise roll our eyes at into needlessly high-stakes nonsense. Every minor issue has to be given an extra helping of- to be continued. Just look at her relationship with Rio, famed anime Super Chad. Whoa ho! Mmm, Rio. Uga Uga is free. There's no reason Jem has to pretend to Rio that she and Jerrica are two different people. I mean, they were already dating, and he's intimate with the band as road manager and technician, and he's knee deep as it is. Instead, the two of them lead each other on a merry chase that makes Virginia Woolf read like Sea Spot Run. Do you. do you like me? I hardly know you. No. I can't hurt Jerrica like this. But Rio! Jam, wait! I... Isn't Jerrica supposed to meet us? Leave me alone, Aja. Come on! I wish someone would tell me what's going on. God, he reminds me of someone. Like this whole show, it's got this look. What does it remind me of? It's on the tip of my tongue. There's a bunch of things here I don't care for. I could do with less of the preaching about the power of friendship, shaking hands with my man, all that. And all the other issues that come across as patronizing. Learn how to read. I know it's all well intentioned, there's a clear edge to Jem that wants to do good, and it attempts to broach themes that weren't prevalent in kids shows of the era, even if some of it reads like either governmental policy or a hilariously misjudged attempt to sound sincere. Wouldn't you rather come to the benefit and see Jem in the holograms? And then afterwards you can all stay at Haven House and talk to a counselor. Behind all of that, though, is a great concept and, frankly, a solid set of likeable characters. It's probably just me, but I find it all so endearing. I love business talk. I love showbiz conflict. I love it even more when it's co-sponsored by Barney the Dinosaur's colorblind art team. And I love it the most when it's set to music. Uh -huh, uh. The penny just dropped for my returning fans. Hi, I'm Mask, and I like musicals. <laughs> So far, most of this has been pretty backhanded, but I mean it when I say there's things I genuinely like, regardless of the production quality. We're, we're all on the same page there, I think. Being about a band, and MTV being huge at the time, Jem had the bright idea to include something of a pace changer. Music videos. Oh no! It was mostly so that cassettes could be sold with the dolls, making the songs products too. But it also meant that the episode format needed to accommodate their inclusion. There had been cartoons before this that featured pop music interludes, but they were more or less inconsequential to what was going on in the story. Whereas in Gem, they tended to comment directly on either the action or how the characters were feeling, literally or abstractly. It was basically a musical series. Deception. How long must I continue this deception? Not saying it was terribly profound, it, it wasn't, but it makes music an active part of the show rather than a complete afterthought. It's important to the characters and therefore important to the form the show takes. We as an audience actually get to hear the music they make, lucky us, and both Jem and the Misfits are given equal opportunities to present their work and take centre stage. Their styles are very distinct. Jem is part of a good girl band, so all her songs are quite emotive and heavy on the melodies. Her singing voice, Britta Phillips, has light colour to her vocals that lifts those sugar-sweet sounds, but she was more of an independent singer than a mainstream gal, so she's also got this sick edge that rips into the upper registers.
In contrast, The Misfits, the bad girl group, strays from that popular sweetness with hard acerbic tracks that anarchically play with rhythm. Ellen Bernfeld's voice is more clipped, and she likes to bend the notes to get that classic rock or Britpunk sound, which I've got to say is definitely my speed. The music videos themselves can lack the talent and money of what they're replicating, but it's nice that they bothered to include them at all. We see stylized takes on the action unfolding, either riffing on what's happening, or might be happening, or would never happen, mostly that. Fish peep. It's a great excuse to shake up the action with bizarre imagery, and have fun with the format. You can imagine how much a talented studio could go to town with that concept. Not that we don't get to see some striking images here or there, on top of all the funny stuff, for he, we, there they go. Songs were written by Ford Kinder, Anne Bryant, and Barry Harmon, who produced quite a sizable number of of tracks. As such, it can be a bit of a mixed bag. Some of them are, as you might expect, kind of clumsy, incredibly on the nose, throwaway, and uh, well. Every now and then, though, there's an absolute banger that might just have something kind of clever going on. The bonus of selling the music to us like this is that it helps make both bands' popularity credible in their world. Jem's mainstream sound and good image results in a strong following, seeming reliable as a public figure. That actually makes room for the Misfits to be just as popular. Being so completely alternative to that style kind of sets them up as an underdog for the public to root for. You can see people having arguments about who was more underrated, who was more manipulative with their image, the conspiracy theories that would emerge from both. It's a very strong basis for that kind of storytelling and indeed world building. We even get two characters who are the direct result of that public split. Two of their fans who become sidekicks, Video and her cousin Clash. You never guessed how she got that name. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to Gem, folks. And you know, music is this exciting, heightened language anyway. It gives off a different kind of emotional response because it's communication without words or images. Music can represent different voices at the same time, so things in opposition harmonize as part of the same whole. <laughs> One thing Jem did well in this regard was contextualizing direct conflict through music. So we saw the Misfits and the Holograms fight through their songs. Likewise, they could represent ideas in a way speaking them didn't do justice. Like using sickly, falling vocals and a baseline heartbeat to depict love as a poison. And music wasn't limited to the two main bands either. As the characters developed or when new ones were introduced, it gave them an excuse to offer new variations specific to the person involved. I can see me itching to perform. I can see me singing up a storm. I can see me a star. The introduction of new characters was always entertaining for this very reason. When the holograms and the misfits went out looking for new recruits, it gave the music a chance to chronicle both newcomer Raya's trials and the introduction of the next best misfit. Jetta. I'll show you Yankee. Ah, finally, a Brit to bring some real class to this Yankee trash. You watch your mouth, you mangy lowlife Yank. I'm a blue blood, you know. It's an excellent concept. Pizzazz throwing down a beat to test Jetta's skills firsthand, and what a bop!
A character called Dance comes in to join Jem as a choreographer, and because she's supposed to be so awe-inspiring and artistic, everything has to slow down. This was the funniest character on the show. In Season 3, Jem and the Misfits find themselves facing competition against a new band, the Stingers, a bunch of German smooth-talking hucksters who dress like bees. They added a much-needed injection of fresh drama to the show in its final hours, as well as having a few numbers of their own that, well, it's a vibe. <laughs> While there were certainly episodes that were pure fluff, there was just as much that took me off guard in how invested I became. For a start, they actually bothered to have a consistent continuity from beginning to end. Impressive when no attempt was being made in much more enduring shows. Small details kept coming back I didn't expect to, and made the show feel more satisfying moving forward, which has helped when they bothered to stick to the personalities of the characters and see where it logically took them when they were pushed that bit further. Perhaps there were typical missteps, time travel, but it wasn't afraid to throw unusual ideas at the wall just to see what stuck. Like this absolutely bonkers episode where they save the president from a presidential themed supervillain. You're gonna remember that guy. Christy Marx would be the writer who brought things back to the drama of the band's business of course, which led to some genuinely clever ideas about Jem as a brand in her own world. Rotating writers outside of Christy Marx produced content worth pointing out too, many being big names in the comics industry. Marv Wolfman, known for writing Werewolf by Night, managed to yes, that's him, managed to write some very funny episodes. My life is a garbage heap. My life's full of choking gas. He also penned the one where Kimber and Stormer, both picked on by their respective bands for different reasons, form their own two-woman show. Shippers like this one. Greg Wiseman got involved at one point. Paul Dini. He, he totally wrote an episode. You know, Paul Dini. The guy who wrote for Batman. The guy who wrote Zatanna. The guy who effectively married Zatanna. The guy who really, really likes Zatanna. Paul? Paul? Oh dear. Certainly as things went on and the production quality went up, the writing got stronger to the point where we not only got decent drama, but decent satire as the show sent itself up on more than one occasion. I tell you, once Dio entered the show, there, there, there was no going back. There's a lot of fun to be had here, and while there was definitely moments of <laughs> Jem had loads that kept me coming back for more. Watching these bands flex and pout and generally make a nuisance of themselves, it was always good stuff, and even better, they bothered to end it. Maybe not a hugely satisfying conclusion to begin with, they made an effort to wrap up all the major beats and say one last goodbye to everyone who mattered. And I won't lie, it got me. <laughs> It was the end. I'd, I'd run out of time to have fun with the Starlight crew, but I'd certainly had an absolute blast watching this, both with friends and on my own. It got me thinking about new ways to do musical content. It, it got me fired up to care. That's pretty good. I, I can take just that, man. Jem was so barefaced in its lunacy. One of those things that shouldn't work, and yet it works. It shouldn't be, and yet it be. It was just... <laughs> it was truly outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. I'll show myself the door. I don't want to make a room! Shell will be right back after these messages. Jam, girl, jam! Stop! Jam's my name! There won't be a story today. Jem's gone. Jerrica's gone. And Jem and the holograms will never play again. This is how I retroactively found myself slightly irritated by both the Gem movie and the direction I saw Hasbro taking in recent revival attempts. On the one hand, that's great. If people are buying and reading and liking this stuff, that's brilliant. Nobody asked me for obvious reasons, but I'm not a fan. I feel when you update Gem, it isn't Gem anymore. That look, that sound, that innocence was what it was all about. A show that sat in a VHS shop window since like 1845. I have no issue with more realistic relationship-based comics and stuff. I know a lot of good ones, but it's not exactly what I came here. 
here for. You've got to commit with Jem. You can't just make a movie like everything else. You can't focus on, oh, how are we gonna make the band look and sound up to date? What's Synergy supposed to be interpreted as? Will Gary Oldman play Tech Rat? No, it's gotta be super intense. Something that isn't afraid to laugh at itself and acknowledge the show's full-on nature. I'm talking Blues Brothers, I'm talking Muppet Movie, Strictly Boring, Flash Gordon, Speed Arissa. Spinal Tap. You do The Rise of Gem as an icon against the Misfits, a band who does what they do for music versus a band who does what they do for the fame, a conflict that can be mirrored in Jericho's struggle with the Gem persona. Don't be shy, put on the wig, respect the wig. I think it has to be a period piece to really translate to, even in the face of 80s fatigue, which is not a real long-term issue. Yes, 80s worship at the moment is everywhere, and it's annoying, just like when everyone was harking back to the 20s only a few years after that passed. And Lord knows, there has never been a good or strong 20s-inspired piece of work since then. Just, just do it. Just stop wasting my time. M make the movie. No, no, no. Let me make the movie. I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, Hasbro. Please. I've, I've never wanted a job more in my life. I swear. You got, you got to give it. Come on. And don't let a man drown. I'm making a million dollars with my experience of making substandard internet review videos. Mmm. Joking aside, I, I do actually have a point. I think the gem I like is lost forever. And I'm fine with that. I'm not expecting it to come back. I'm not the target audience. I'm not the generation it's trying to speak to anymore. Hasbro has to do what makes sense to them. This was absolutely an accident. I am the stalker with the restraining order. Good. My small hopes, however, are, I think, achievable. All I want is for other people to maybe think about it. Maybe see it. Maybe be inspired by it. Maybe do something about it. This is a cool cartoon setup worth taking advantage of. And I'm definitely stealing all of its ideas. Bye. Yes. 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 Cause <laughs>